My name is Eugene Driscoll. Welcome to Valley Naval Gazing on 103.5 FM, WNHH at a New Haven. You can also hear this podcast on <coughs> valleyindy.org. If you search Naval Gazing or look at the Naval Gazing tab at the top of valleyindy.org. We're on iTunes, we're on SoundCloud, we're on Libsyn, we're everywhere. YouTube! Today, uh, making his monthly appearance is Seymour First Selectman, Kurt Miller. Kurt, thank you for coming on the program. Always a pleasure to be here with you guys. And I'm going to do my, I, I forgot to do a sound check before we started, so if you didn't hear the first uh, couple of minutes there, the first 40 seconds, I don't care. So this is the first time you've been on. We're going to talk all, it's, it's all Seymour. Also joining co-host, Valley Indy reporter, Ethan Fry. Hello. The legend. The legend, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, it's our all Seymour episode. The last time Kurt Miller was on, we uh, were talking about, it was the post-election show, which I thought was the best darn episode of Valley Naval Gazing ever. At least since my last one, yeah. But, well, you are, you do get the ratings. You do get the <laughs> clicks. You're like, you're like BuzzFeed. You're like a walking BuzzFeed. I am. Uh, but that one, not, I guess people who are sick of Trump, didn't get as many listens as I, as I had hoped. But, uh, but it was a good one, so anyway. He's doing a nice job, though, isn't he? So far, so good. Well, he hasn't taken the reins yet, though. He's, I don't know about that. And he's already being impactful. And he is being impactful. He's tweeting the hell out of every. He hates Saturday Night Live. They're biased. <sighs> yeah, I, you know. <laughs> All right, let's get, let's get to something. Let, let's, there's news is breaking in Seymour. It's yes. Actually, it's actually but two days old. Before we start, I'm introducing a new sound effect. Oh, it's okay. going to be the dumb question bell. So when you hear that, that means I object to the question you've just asked. Now, I'll note you've introduced this new sound on an episode where we'll be taking questions from the public. So hopefully you won't be binging the uh, Seymour ne- residents. I would never bing a resident. Who have uh, s- submitted questions. All right. I'm under enough pressure. You think I prepared for this? Christine Sir- Syriac. Yes. The uh, uh, Seymour Superintendent of Schools announced Monday, I was told, uh, at the end of a Board of Education meeting uh, that she is leaving or retiring. She's retiring. At, yes. the end of the, at the end of the school year. Yes. So I went back for a second. I found uh, she became the Seymour Superintendent in 2011. and She was the Associate Superintendent yes. at the time. And she had worked as of 2011 in the district for about uh, seven years. So here she is talking about her goals for the school district. And again, this is when she took the reins in 2011. Let's see if this works. It might not, because I don't know what I'm doing. And I just clicked off the page. So this is good radio. What would you like to accomplish as a superintendent? Um, You know, I I think my priority, Tony, would be that I want to keep our focus on student learning. Student learning is what um, education is about, so that will be my primary primary area of focus. Any ideas on how to boost that? Um, Some of the things that, you know, we've talked about in the past is to make certain that we're providing um, support for our students, that we challenge our students, and I would like to offer that we also continue to provide um, that support and professional learning opportunities for our teachers to um, continuously increase their skills. As well. Okay, so that was uh, Superintendent Christine Syriac. So. When I heard that uh, she's going to be retiring, uh, you know, the first question you, you kind of think about is uh, what was her impact uh, on Seymour <coughs> and the school district in general? And <coughs> it seemed like we don't cover uh, the, the school district day to day, but she seemed to be a bit of a stabilizing element within that school district. Mm-hmm. I seem to remember there, were, there would be some conflict uh, prior, more often than not, between like the town government and, and the school board. To us. <coughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'm completely wrong, but uh, what are your impressions of uh, the superintendent? You know, from, from my perspective, I found Christine to be an exceptional uh, superintendent. She was very kid-focused, <coughs> which I think is a great thing. Um, she cared a lot about making sure that the Seymour kids got the best education possible. But I think more importantly, she was an exceptional leader. She understood the importance of the town and the Board of Education working together. So she's been an excellent partner for me over the last five years as we started to merge some of these different uh, programs, some of these different activities together. You know, we successfully merged uh, technology 
which has been an absolute home run. Uh, we're now working on merging facilities. So Christine's retirement will definitely be a blow, I think, to um, to the town, a blow in a good way because, I mean, she's been so valuable. But, uh, you know, you work that hard, you get to the level that she's at, you certainly earn your retirement. I'll be sad to see her go. I'm going to, you know, we still haven't officially spoken yet. Mm -hmm. um, she did reach out and let me know that she was going to do that, but just schedules have not um, allowed us to get together. Um, as of yet, I know this is going to be a little bit in the future, but yeah, well, I might take this part out and post it, uh, to, we're recording this on December 7th, right. Pearl Harbor day, uh, in Ansonia. And actually the superintendent, as I, as we're recording this, got back to me, uh, I, I reached out to see if she would do an interview, but she asked that it be, uh, delayed till tomorrow. But, uh, in any event, yeah, the, the, this news came December 5th. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, you, have you talked to anybody on the school board yet? Uh, where do they go from here? I guess that's a search committee is formed. How do they go about hiring a new superintendent? Um, have, I've had a lot of communication with Yashu Patori, who's the chairman of the board. Uh, Yashu is a good friend of mine. Um, they will put together a, a search committee, and they will go through the process. In the past, uh, the associate superintendent is generally the person who becomes the new uh, superintendent, but I'm not sure the path that they will follow. Uh, that time I am going to try to hopefully talk Christine into staying I mean I, I truly believe she's an asset to to Seymour and I would love for her to stay for another two or three more years but you know like as I said she's put in her time and she's earned um, a good retirement which I hope that uh, she will have and it seems to to me that the school <coughs> board and the superintendent and you, t you touched upon this a little bit but uh, they've really made an effort to bring the community into like the budget process yep. which is always so tough to do mm -hmm. Because uh, Simo was really uh, uh, voting down budgets, uh, sort of locally, famously, where mm. there was a zero percent increase, and 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 they voted it down. There seemed to be some uh, backlash for whatever reason among uh, the public. They clearly made their voices known by defeating a lot of budgets. But they, the boards, really worked uh, with the superintendent to to turn that around. Would you say? Yeah, I think in the past there was always a big discrepancy between what the board of education presented and what the first selectman of the board of finance thought that they should have. Uh, Christine has worked very closely with myself, um, with the Board of Finance to present the reasons why the school system needs the money um, that they do. Board of Education, I think, has done a great job over the last couple of years in being very proactive and as transparent as they possibly can in putting information out to the residents. So I think that's helped. And I think if you noticed over the last couple of years, the budget presentation that I make, the number that I put in there is very close to the number that the Board of Education is asking for, because I'm pretty satisfied with what they're doing and how they're working to bring those numbers down. I mean, last year they only asked for an $18,000 increase, which, you know, on a $35 million budget, I think we can all agree is, is pretty incredible. Basically so it, nothing. Yeah. So I think the residents are starting to have that confidence in them that, you know, we're all working together. We're working towards that goal of that five-year plan that we put in place to stabilize the mill rate. And I think that's why you're seeing these budgets start to go through now on the first time because people see that transparency, they have that confidence, and you know a lot of that comes from Christine and her leadership on on that side. Okay, so like, and then moving on to another topic, <coughs> as I as I said earlier, we're recording this on December seventh. It's gonna uh, be released on uh, December nineteenth. There'll be a, a slight delay because we're trying to record some of these in advance to make our lives easier. But I had the uh, pleasure of attending a bunch of Seymour events wow. over the last... What do you mean, wow? <laughs> is that, that stupid? You're classifying that as stupid? No, I'm You're just, just excited. I'm excited you guys are actually in Seymour. How did you get the bell, anyway? Did you bring that bell with you? The bell you? was sitting right oh. there. I just happened to grab it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I went to the Seymour Christmas Parade. Yes. For, for the first time. Great job uh, they do every year. Yeah, it was... Mr. A, Lang and his team. Yeah. It was really a, a <coughs> great event, uh, and we streamed it online. I got that, right? Because yep. my, my wife uh, was a former post photographer, Connecticut post photographer. She doesn't work there anymore, but they offered some freelance, and she said, would, would I go? And I don't like to leave my house, you know, despite I have two young kids, but even I was like, oh, I can't. All right, I'll go to this. So I brought the kids, and I streamed it. I, I took mm -hmm. out my phone and, and streamed it. It got something like 3,000 views yep. on uh, Facebook, which amazed me. It's by far the biggest thing we've done on I, Facebook I guess Live. guess that's all we should do, basically. I'm sure the uh, elected officials of the Valley would be thrilled. Right, just parades, all parades <laughs> all the time. Shifted the, our coverage to that. But, so that was a good one. And then uh, <coughs> the next week, 
I went and saw Santa get off the Metro North train yes, during yep. during a first Saturday event, and then walked down with my son, wife. Uh, well, first we went out to dinner. This was what is Zoe's? Is that how you say that? Zoe's. Zoe's. Okay. Zoe's. Yeah. That's that's rhymes with Rolls Royce. I did I did Zoe's. not know that. Oh. But that's common. People will say Zoe's. Yeah. No, I'm going to still yeah. say Zoe's. I apologize because that's what Zoe's. Zoe's. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, it's always been Zoe's to me my entire life. And I asked Jimmy Zeppos. The owner, and he said, "No, it's Zoe's." That's what it yeah. is. So we went. We had we had pizza there, and I was with uh, Hugh Bailey, the Connecticut Post uh, business oh, right, editor, yeah. right? Adjunct Fairfield U journalism professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that guy, he's he's F-U really nice. Fu plug in. What? Get the Fu uh, plug right. in. Fairfield as, a, as an alumnus. Yeah. So then we go oh, up there, and we we. How long have you been doing the uh, uh, Santa getting off the train thing? I should know that Santa was about fifteen to twenty minutes late because it is the Waterbury line. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so six or seven years, I'm gonna say, maybe eight years. It's been a few years. Culture and Arts Commission in Seymour organizes that through the help of uh, Phil Willemy, okay. who's uh, Phil's very active in in town. Him and his wife work for Metro North. So they help get it set up so we can have Santa come in, which is really nice of them. Yeah, it was, to do. Yeah. it was great. And there had to be, I mean, there had to be 300 people right there at the train station. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the roads are closed there and you can go to like the antiques. And all. Mm. Not that I go antiquing, you know, what do I do? But I did go to, the, I walked into the bakery. Yeah. Well, it's the first year I missed uh, it. I was kind of disappointed well, to miss it, but I was, I was out of town. That's yeah. where I was going with all this. Yeah. I didn't want to, as the report, where, the, where were you? <laughs> I was looking for Kurt Miller. Yeah, I had a previous... First selectman, nowhere to be found. I had a previous What do you have against Christmas? No, I'm a big Christmas guy, as you know, but... Uh, no, How I do pre- I know that? I had a previous engagement, so I couldn't uh, I couldn't get there for that, but... So, and then the, the just to, to bring this to uh, an end, it, then there was a tree lighting down at the... Uh, the Legion Hall, the yeah. Legion, yeah, it was, it was really cool. So Which was great, because that tree just went up on Friday. As you know, we got the two trees from the Regional Water Authority this year, the one there and the one at Broad Street Park. Uh, they both came in Friday, were put up immediately by Public Works, and they were able to get them decorated so it can be lit for uh, for Saturday night, which was great. So how are things in downtown Seymour now? With the you got the new construction, which was sort of hotly debated as it was happening, but mm-hmm. now the building is pretty much uh, there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was I'm doing stories on Derby redevelopment, their redevelopment zone, and, and the way these planners describe what they want to do there. <laughs> It basically comes down to they want to take a Seymour downtown and sort of start from scratch and put it in in the redevelopment zone. So how's the local economy up there in the uh, in the in the downtown? Uh, it's, I think it's definitely getting better. Um, the old Maple Street School, as you know, we sold that to a developer who converted that into uh, about forty market rate apartments. Was that John Geds? John Geds, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, is that is that project? Uh, it's all the, it's completely sold out. Wow. So okay. they as soon as apartments became available, they went. Um, and that's kind of what you're looking for. That when you talk about that transit-oriented development, you want apartments like that within a half a mile of the train station, so people can walk down, get on the train, and then take the train back and forth to work. So now, the big fear there, and the same fear you you hear in Derby that it was just going to be federally subsidized uh, housing. Did that ever come true there? Uh, no, I believe the average rent there is uh, fourteen hundred a month. And who do you know, like the age, like the average uh, age or of the of people no. living there? Do they have kids? Is it like they're one and two bedrooms? Okay. So if you know, it could be a young family with a child, but I don't really didn't get into that with, I only with John because they all they say when they market these things, millennials, millennials. You just mm. throw out millennials, and I'm just wondering if there, there's a, a, a new development that actually is started and finished in the last uh, year or so. I'm wondering if millennials actually did. Uh, move in to that because that's what they're sort of promising and doing. Yep. So well, I think, listen, if you can get that age group to buy those apartments that are going to be downtown, I mean, that's how South Norwalk is so prevalent. You have all those bars and restaurants and activity going on downtown because you have people that are down there because so many people live in that area. They walk, they go to the restaurants and they keep the nightlife going. That brings more people in, which is a great thing. And these people hop on the trains and they go up and down Fairfield County, wherever they need to go to work. So I think it's important we really need to push to get this Waterbury branch line uh, up to snuff. And I, hopefully it will be a priority um, for the governor and our state representatives and state senator senators excuse me, in the, uh, in the next two or three years. Because I think that would breathe a tremendous amount of life back into the valley, particularly into uh, Seymour and Sonia Derby. And then speaking of uh, state senators, let's move to a political topic. Sure. In the last uh, couple of weeks, Kevin Rennie, I think on his blog, 
or the Daily Ructions. Mm. Yeah. He's uh, he kind of broke that Rob Kane, who represents Seymour, has mm-hmm. explored, uh, has formed an exploratory uh, committee. Mm-hmm. If I'm using the right term, and then uh, Danbury Mayor uh, Mark Big Papa Pow- Bowton mm-hmm. has also uh, declared his intent, I guess more or less, to run for governor. Uh, now the question is, I mean, you're close to Rob Kane, he represents your town, but yep. you've also had some alliance with uh, Mark Bowton when he stumbles into the valley. Uh, you were heavily involved in Mark Loretti's. Uh, the other, yeah, the other one. 2014. And now, uh, and, and I should note the day. the, the or Bout- 15, sorry. This Bowton Kane stuff bubbled up. 14. Suddenly, suddenly uh, Loretti for governor on Facebook, like, yeah. <laughs> came, like stumbled out. It's like oh, all of a sudden. Uh, so what's so? Where are you? Uh, where do you land? Where do this? I land, Mr. Republican, who's involved with all three of these gentlemen? Well, first let me say I think all three of them, um, Senator Kane, Mayor Bowen, and Mayor Loretti, would make exceptional governors. I think they all have the uh, necessary experience to do the job, and I would be thrilled if any one of them were governor. To be quite honest with you, I mean I'm personal friends with all three. So, you know, at least in this initial stage, I will certainly be financially supporting all three of their um, their campaigns, making maximum donations to them. I'll help any of them fundraise because I believe in all of that. Um, you know, Mayor Loretti and I have obviously a very good, uh, not only working relationship, but a close friendship with all that we accomplish. I did help him in 2014, and I have committed to helping him in 2018 if he does choose to run for uh, governor again, which I, I believe that, that he will. Uh, but regardless, I will support 100% whoever um, our candidate is uh, for governor in, in 2018. At uh, Thanksgiving, I was up in New Hartford with my in-laws, uh, and they're Republican, and I was asking them had, whether they had heard of Mark Bowden, and I was amazed that they had no idea who he was. Really? Uh, yeah, it was. It was really. I mean, he's run. He ran for lieutenant governor, right? He was 2010. The, he, he was the. He was a lieutenant governor candidate. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it, I, I'm wondering what the. Uh, but they knew some local guys up there who I guess have uh, have are hmm. thinking about throwing their hats into the ring. So it, it just made me think, like, what what are the what is that? Our scanner going off somewhere? Yeah. What's the uh, what's the biggest obstacle to getting a Republican? in the governor's office this time around. I mean, obviously, Governor Malloy is still very unpopular uh, from anything uh, mm. to see. What do you think the 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 biggest obstacle is? Well, I think the Is har- it name recognition, or is it just... Well, I, I think the, the two things that every candidate struggles with in this system, number one is name recognition. While these um, guys may be popular in their areas, you know, how much has that transcended those areas across the state? And I think even more challenging is raising the $250,000 that you need to at $100 a pop. It's one thing if you can get these major donors that give you 1000 5000 10000 That makes it very easy. But when you have to hit 20, you have to get 2,500 people to give you $100. In theory, that sounds easy, but it's not. Hmm. And it has derailed a lot of very good candidates over the last couple of election cycles because they just haven't had the wherewithal to do that. You know, out of the three, I think Mayor Loretti has the... Um, the best track record when it comes to he raising can raise money. money. He, he can, can raise money, yeah. But, I, you know, he may not have the best name recognition statewide out yeah, of the, the three. The last time around, I think he raised about a hundred grand in three months or so. It was like about a hundred and forty grand, yeah, in about the three and a half months. So he can. But I mean, then, that, yeah, you there, know, was, he, there was never a. It always like you know the 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 leader out of the 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 entire thing, the entire race uh, in the Republican field last time around seemed to be Tom Foley, just because he had run before he had the name recognition from being the the party nominee. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's generally accepted that Bouton would have beat Bouton would have fared better against Malloy. So um, would have John McKinney. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so. I think if John McKinney won the primary, I think John McKinney right now would be the governor of Connecticut, to be quite honest. Hmm. All right, and do you think Malloy add? will run for re-election, or will somebody God, I like, hope so. Will, <laughs> will somebody God, like, I, I, I would so. assume you think that, you oh, know. Oh, Kevin Lembo. If somebody like Kevin Lembo ran, would something. the Republicans Ooh. have a tougher. You mentioned uh, him once before. Ke- let me tell you something. Kevin Lembo would be a very difficult candidate 
to beat because he's he's a straight shooter. He's a good guy, um, regardless of his political affiliation. Um, you know, he's a finance guy, so I can I can relate to that. I just like the way he conducts himself. He's he's just a regular guy, um, but he's tough when he needs to be. He calls it as he sees it. I think he would be the most difficult of the Democrats to to defeat. So I'm hoping um, that Governor Malloy decides to run for a, a third term. All right, let's take. Uh, Akmi, don't ask me if I'm running for governor. Let's go, what? Akmi, don't ask me if I'm running for governor. I'm a little. I'm going to ring the bell on that one. I assume you're angling for a job within state government of some kind. No. You're going to be like DMV commissioner for uh, oh God, that, that Governor like a, Loretti. That oh, like I would sentence. love that. I would love that. No, I think I'd like to be like chief of staff to the lieutenant governor or something like that. I mean, that's that seems like a fun one. All right. So about three hours ago, again, it's December 7th when we're taping this, I put a call on uh, Facebook asking Seymour residents uh, – whether they had any questions for first selectman Miller. And we had six comments. Most, most are from a Julie Lynn who asked a, a couple of questions there. Uh, oh, and this was, this was actually a question we were going to ask you. Tritown, yep. you had said a few months ago, and Ethan's been itching to, uh, to ask this too. Uh, it, we, there was something was supposed to happen at Tritown with Ron Spector, uh, the Nevada resident who owns the shopping mm-hmm. center, I think we were talked about. Do you remember it was or probably demo like, stuff? yeah the the middle part of it. Kurt the, Miller probably remembers. I don't know the why former I'm Ames was going to be demoed. Yes, what's but going on? With, nothing. Yeah, yeah. That place will never be redeveloped. The well, you know, I've had multiple conversations with Mr. Spector over the last couple of weeks. Um, the numbers came in higher than he had anticipated substantially higher than he had anticipated for to, demolition to demo it yeah because there's some remediation issues um involved in that obviously being an old building any old building that's you know demo there's always those concerns so he's in the process now of uh, getting some specific reports that we need i've reached out to uh, my good friend rick dunn at the naugatuck valley council of governments to see if there is any state funding available that would help uh, in this remediation that we could provide to Mr. Spector to allow this project to move forward. So we're in that that process now. Uh, where our timeline is, I can't specifically say, because, uh, you know, when you get state funding, there's a lot of strings sometimes that come along with it that can delay different things. But I can assure you, Mr. Spector wants to take these buildings down. He wants to redevelop um, this parcel, but he needs to do so in a way that fiscally makes sense for him, which I fully understand. Is he serious about redeveloping if he's only just now exploring whether there's grant money out there to help with the remediation? Wouldn't he have known that? I don't think it's something that he anticipated, to be quite honest with you, or oh. anticipated it would be this high. Okay. Because I had reached out to him and you know said, Ron, I thought we were looking at you know an October-ish time frame for this. And then that's at that point when he had told me, you know, I'd gotten these numbers and they're, they're much higher. I'm not sure how I'm going to go about doing this. And at that point, I approached him and said, there could be the potential of some remediation assistance out there. Is that something you'd be interested in? And he said potentially, just Is depending on what. Like soil? We're talking about stuff in the ground? Or? There could be some soil issues. There could be some stuff, um, you know, the PCBs within the windows and the, the caulking and, and stuff like that. Okay. And then Julie Lynn also asked, any news on the opening of the 67-42 connector through Franklin Street? The... Um, and for, let me just, because uh, I'm not sure exactly what she's talking about. Is that like the stop it behind stop? That's, yeah, that's or? the okay. connector road that would run from in front of the Seymour Police Department. Okay. Parallel to Route 8 on the other side of the river, all the way up to Beacon Falls. Okay. We applied for a $10 million Tiger Grant uh, through the federal government, which we were denied on. So, you know, we're trying to reevaluate um, what would be the best course of action to try to get that money. So or right now there's no money to, and that's not, no. so that means if there's no money to do that, that's a, uh, uh, Haynes owns the property that they're, yeah, the they Haynes, can't, they yeah, can't Haynes develop that. They can't develop their property until that road is put in. Is well, I mean, they're, they're in the middle of a pretty big operation up in Oxford. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how much funds they could divert to, to this project, to be quite honest. Um, I know once the Oxford project is done, that the Seymour project is a priority for them. But again, that comes down to, you know, can we get the road in or not? If, you know, they need to pay $10 million for a road, you know, how much money does that leave them for development of the property and different things like that? So, you know, we've looked at a lot of different options. Seymour paying for a portion, Beacon Falls paying for a portion, and the developer paying for a portion, trying to 
um, you know, parse the money out that way. But I don't know. It's something that we're going to continue exploring. We will apply for a Tiger Grant again at you know, the next round of Tiger Grants, um, and we'll see how that goes. I wasn't Trump's thrilled. big on infrastructure. Yeah, if he uh, lives up to that. And, you know, you know, you try to make the case of the value that this $10 million would do. It would open up, you know, 250-plus acres of developable land, the impact that it would have on Seymour's economy, Beacon Falls economy, the valley in general. It makes you wonder why the federal government would choose to fix a building and a, a roadway in New Haven. I, I just don't understand it when it's phase two of a project. Um, Which building are you talking about? The, what the the Tiger Grant was actually awarded to. Um, I just didn't, you know, I read through their proposal and I don't know. To me, it seemed like a an election year type thing. But, you know, that's just my opinion. Once again, the Forgotten Valley. Yeah. That's the uh, feeling locally. All right, so that was that. And then Julie Lynn asked, what's what's up with the state DOD redesign of Church Street 67 intersection? Is that something that's coming? Yep. The, um, Julie Lynn <coughs> sounds like she is Julie like Lynn a DO, DOT uh, <laughs> tra- uh, a traffic engineer or something like that. No, she's actually very active on, on social media, asks a lot of questions. Um, and as you can see, good kind of spot-on type questions. Julie, you want to do freelance? I need one freelancer that can ask yeah. a question. And Julie, at least we'd get some coverage in Seymour, so that would be fantastic. <laughs> Um, no, but th- this hey, at least I showed up for the Christmas event. That's true. That's 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 a that's a plus. <laughs> um, no, the the state is studying the widening of 67 from the intersection of Stop and Shop all the way up through um, essentially Dunkin' Donuts. Or right. Excuse me, uh, McDonald's. All right, as the Derby reporter, I have some experience. This will, yeah, this will be forty years. Yeah, well, that, well years that's what now. it is. It's been it's been several years, but forty years from now they'll they'll finish their uh, historic phase. Yeah. And, well, the, the biggest issue and the point that she brings up is when you come to the bottom of Church Street where it meets 67, um, it's very difficult for cars coming in and out. It's just an old design. So that is something that is in their plans is to redesign that to make it essentially safer is what that comes down to. So it's definitely in their plans. But to your point, what the time frame is, I, I couldn't tell you. Because well, if you right ask now, right now, Ricky Dunn is somewhere throwing uh, pens at his computer. <laughs> no, so that's no. another Rick Dunn would have to be involved in that too, right? Would that be like a Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments type um, thing? Or? Yeah, Rick is somewhat involved in that as well. But I mean, if you look at how the state works, um, you know, Ribbon Street, which my predecessor Paul Roy secured funding for back in 2010, and you know, we just went out to bid for it. So, you know, the state works at its own pace. We've paved. We'll, we'll, put this away. we'll pave close to $10 million worth of roads in the town of Seymour faster than the state of Connecticut will do one mile-long road in the town of Seymour. That's how slow they work. And then, okay, another one from Julie Lynn. Any news to share on the large commercially zoned property across from Webster Bank and the corner lot by the dentist on Upper Route 67? Cool. Any chance those will get developed Slash have tenants this year. Corner lot by the dentist. I'm trying to think where that is. She's um, pretty specific, but uh, if you don't it will, know, it's okay. The one across from Webster Bank, um, that is privately owned, and that person has chosen to try to sell the property themselves. He has been approached by several commercial realtors, but hasn't been interested in um, retaining any of their services. I think it's a fantastic piece of property for any business. I mean, you have plenty of space for parking. You what can is, put up a nice building. Is it undeveloped land right now? Yeah. Or what's, okay. Yep. So oh. there's really no updates um, at this point because nothing is truly going on. I think until uh, that landowner decides to get a commercial realtor, I think that's when you really start to think, see things happen. I mean, I get where he's coming from because, you know, commercial realtors aren't, aren't cheap. Um, so I certainly understand that, but... I don't know. There's nothing new, nothing new to on report. that one. And then the dentist office on the corner. I thought she was saying like there's all the same. Oh, okay. I thought she was talking about <coughs> one property. No, no. What she's talking about, I think, is just past um, the entranceway to the industrial park right on the Seymour-Woodbridge border. Um, there's a little lot right there on the corner. Uh, I'm not aware of any activity there. No Chuck E. Cheese. Is no coming. Chuck E. Cheese or anything like that. No. All right, moving on. Alicia... Or Lisa and Cammy asks, 
Can you please fix Beaver Street slash Clinton Road slash Route 313, 313, I guess it would be? Hold on. I'm on my second alignment. Why is this road being overlooked? Just looking at the look on Ethan's face down there. Um, <coughs> I didn't realize Ethan's still here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uh, well, 313, that part is a, a state road, so we don't we have no uh, say on to that. As for Beaver and Clinton... Off the top of my head, I don't know where they fall in um, in our road program. Um, I'd have to take a look to be to be quite honest with you. So, All right. I mean, I can respond to her um, offline. We are friends on Facebook, so yeah. I can take a look at that. And, and people should get also her an check answer. out people should also check out uh, Office of First Selectman uh, Kurt Miller's office Facebook page for these questions too. So. Anyway, well, thanks for entertaining those uh, questions, and thank you to uh, Julie Lynn and Alicia and whoever else posted questions. We really appreciate it. Uh, Seymour football team. Seymour football team. Had a heck of a, a run. We had we had Ansonia in, in the playoffs. We Shelton. Had Shelton. Oh, yeah. Shelton took out Newtown. And just then they uh, lost. Just lost like Ridgefield. They lost Last Ridgefield, night, yeah. Right? And yeah. then Seymour. Because uh, we had uh, on our Valley Sports Rewind show uh, the two guys hoping <coughs> that it would be Ansonia versus Seymour in the finals, how great that would that be. That would have been something. Seymour's yeah. first win was a uh, upset, right? They beat the well, number one seed. Yeah, Capital, Capital prep, prep, I think. Yeah, that and was thumped them good too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then so got cool. the fa- got the favor returned though by uh, Ridgefield. So how's so. the how's the town doing after that? Well, listen, you know, it was a great year, um, a great season, I should say, sports wise. And, and Seymour football team did did very well. Girls volleyball was uh, state champs. You know, all of our uh, you know soccer did well. Swimming. Uh, did extremely well, so you know we have a lot of good, good sports programs in Seymour, which I think is great because you know the more activities you provide for kids, I think the better off they're going to do in, in school. And I think it's you know it needs to be more than just. I mean, I'm a sports guy. Don't get me wrong, but I think it needs to be more than sports. We need to be looking to create other activities for our kids, whether it be music or arts or mm. or different things like that, to give those kids something, you know, that they can you know, grab onto as well. And um, again, I think the more that we provide for our kids, I think the better off they're going to do in school, the better off they're going to be as as they grow up. Now, what about, are you going to be going to uh, the Strand Theater next month, the uh, double feature that I think it's Connecticut Tar or something or other? They're, they're playing Friday the 13th, part two and three, three being in 3D. Are you going to be like first in line for that? I just might. For that? You never month. know. That's happening January 13th. All right, final question, because I actually have to leave in five minutes to go pick up my children at school. You're, now you call what you call my kids dumb? Mm-hmm. Well, well, how about you just go, and Ethan and I will just carry on. Because Ethan doesn't know how to end this thing. I, I, I haven't taught him that. I think it's a matter of probably just hitting the stop button. We'll figure it out. Or, so yeah, just pour a coffee onto the uh, keyboard. Yeah, 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 I'm sure so that'll yeah, do it. Yeah, you yeah. notice it's dark in here because Ethan, uh, Ethan, so uh, far it's not dark in since, here. First well, of all, it's dark right over there. Used to be a lamp right here. You go into my. I don't have any lights in my in my office for various reasons. So I went out, spent my own money, got a, got a little lamp. Ethan broke it at the beginning of the week. Oh boy, Ethan, like the, his old computer is here. There's bite marks in it. I don't even know what happened there. What else have you broken? You broke uh, our flip our cam. first video camera. First video first camera. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I took. Pr- I had paternity, well, you were on leave. paternity leave. I had a. You know, I'm trying to take care of my children. I just took it out and stomped on breaking it. Breaking five stuff. times. Yeah. Took off it. Uh, the lamp, though, there was there was <laughs> the you had it plugged in and the cord was like across the entire. Oh, it was a trip like, tripped over. Yeah, yeah. It's an I OSHA could. violation. I, exactly. How did, you, how did you beat Rory in that 5K? That's you're what I want to know. You can't well, make it from here to the door without falling. And somehow you're lucky better, I'm even here without Rory. a uh, Rory workers' comp. A, uh, workers' R- comp. Rory was in what? This is bar- they, they ran the uh, Thanksgiving 5K together. And Not together. I mean, like I happened to see. Hey, that's what's his name? What the Commoner Hall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I signed up for smoking. that. I didn't run though. What What is that about? I didn't get up. My wife just, went instead. Just got the t-shirt. My wife represented. I did. She brought me home a t-shirt. She sure did. Nice. I didn't realize you could even do that. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that next year. She's the runner. She was like 24 or something. I don't know. She oh. runs like she's being chased. Fry quit uh, yeah, smoking. Yeah. He quit. He quit. Uh, you know, he's he hasn't quit breaking stuff in the office, but he's not smoking. You really time. beat Rory Rory Burke in a five Acor- Yeah, according to the the times. Yeah. What was your time? I was speculating that he, but like, did he show up late and like? Was it like five minutes gone already when he started? I don't he know. He was carrying Jason Prillo on his back. That's what it was. They were running. 
Perillo beat me by like five minutes. Yeah, Perillo's, uh, Perillo's my a good runner. My, my time was like just well, under a half hour. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's not not excellent, but yeah, considering I was it's particularly uh, that hill. They tease you with 30. that hill yeah, going yeah, yeah. up by. No, yeah, Archie that's Morris. the thing. Like you, you know, you once you get to the the halfway point, you're pretty much uh, it's pretty much all downhill from there. Literally all downhill. From I there. think Archie Moore should be open if you feel the need to stop for a beer and some wings. I mean, that should be an and option. And I'd run. Mm. All right, let's talk about speaking of booze. Uh, wow, really this, that's quite a segue. That. Speaking of um, booze, the Mavuli family. I've been reading. Actually, I've been following tweets on on the Twitter right. by voices mm-hmm. saying Donald that, Trump. Uh, no, nah, I don't follow that guy. Although I, he is like the modern Mad Magazine. If you look at him that way, he's like, you don't need to. But I'd be concerned if I was in the news media with Donald Trump. Mm. This vi- I'm wondering what the what the reason for you guys is at this point. Do you want me to replay? I got him. I got him right got down my, here. I got my news right from Twitter. Did you listen to our our last our previous podcast where I talked to him? Me and him are tight. I didn't realize you guys were were people. Do you not listen? You only listen to this podcast when you're on. No, I listen to others. Well, I had we we, we played an interview with uh, Donald Trump from a couple of years ago. But all right. The Mavuli family yep. are talking about, are they in the early stages of exploring whether to open a vineyard of some kind? Mm. Yes. What's the what's going on? Do you, have any, do you know anything about it? What can you tell us? Um, they have a, a piece of property <coughs> on Route 34 that they're looking to turn into. And they own the... Uh, uh, Villa Bianca, Bianca, Tavern 1757. Tavern 1757. The property where Tavern 1757 is. Yep, and they and also... And next door, they own right that next pavement door. place yes. that was sitting there. Okay. Yep, this is uh, further down maybe... Half a mile, three quarters of a mile down the street, obviously across from the river. Um, so right now, it used to be an old quarry, I guess. There was an old kind of junky house that uh, they mm-hmm. took down last year or the year before. Oh, their, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their right. goal is to um, turn that into a, a vineyard and then also have a winery, um, a little ice cream shop, I believe. They have a few, a very nice plan that uh, Tony has, has put together. But because of the amount of soil that needed to be moved, and as you know, the way vineyards are built, they're kind of built on a slope. <clears throat> there needed to be some engineering done to make sure that, you know, um, twenty or 30,000 square yards or whatever the term is of gravel. and dirt Cubic didn't, yards? Yeah, didn't end up on Route 34. So they um, had worked through that process. I, it's basically been signed off on by Inland Wetlands. There is a, one final hearing that comes up. Once that's done, then the project will be approved. And it's my understanding at that point, Tony, then we'll start planting the grapes. Um, I guess it takes two to three years for I don't know anything uh, about for grapes to What about water? Don't you, start need like a, don't you need like a massive amount of water to do that? Or yeah, it was a river right across the street, right? So, so there should be plenty of water. You guys think alike. So there's like a, I, I know there's, so I grew up in Brookfield. There was De Grazia Winery is there. And there's like a, there's a Connecticut wine trail that's like a yeah. sort of a putative little, uh, tourism thing i think that'd be a great thing for that area i mean I, you know i give tony credit for coming up with an idea like that that would certainly bring you know people will swing by a winery just to just to check it out and then if that brings some people into seymour that's that's a great thing yeah and that's i mean you can't get a better location than route 34 i mm. mean that's a that's you know a lot of people travel that road and just down the road where route 34 into derby becomes roosevelt drive uh at 251 roosevelt drive in derby there's very early talk somebody's exploring whether to put a brewery there uh alderman art gherkins on his facebook page a day or two ago uh there was a subcommittee meeting of the board of aldermen and one of the things they discussed was whether to allow a stationary chiller on property owned by the city so i asked about Mm. that and uh someone's poking around about whether they can get a brewery in there so maybe route 34 now is where is could you say like where that property is in relation to like apollo or the do yeah, it's very close it's uh if it's it's west of those properties on route okay. 34 it's one of the old brick buildings i think 251 roosevelt i could be okay. wrong so where the book on places the, place the book place yeah, i okay, believe okay, it's right okay. where like that, that side of the uh, yeah okay. yeah it's right next and then, then there's a uh no, yeah, I could see a Mr. brewery. Junker, the, yeah, uh, yeah, that place opened that, up. That's the type right of like there. building that a, it would seem like a brewery would yeah. want to go to. Yeah, and yeah, that would be a, a good thing for the valley and Derby. So we'll see what happens there. So you're going to get, you know, and that's like, you know, like Pier wineries. That's that's back. like a little, you know, everybody's craft beer is like the the what's hot Pier, thing. You what's know? Pier Thirty Four? That's a, an establishment that was in uh, Seymour for a while on Route Thirty Four. It had a riverfront property. Oh, wasn't aware of it. So. Anyway, you know what? I should go get my uh, two kids in uh, at school right now. So uh, I want to thank first Selectman Miller from coming on. We actually went through all our topics, all seven of them. 
That's not too bad. Right there. Boom. And how was our time? So we are about 40 minutes in. Uh, oh, I got at least another 30 minutes in me. <laughs> well, you showed up 18 minutes late. I, I mean, come over. It was a Miller time. Late. That's Miller time. Come on. Uh, but there's anything else you want to add, though, uh, before we head out? No, but uh, you know, if that brewer out there is listening to this podcast, come on, why do you got to? St- we need something in Derby. <laughs> there is you guys. Pl- you got you got all the state lawmakers could, up in your. You can put your chiller world. anywhere you want on town property. We'll absolutely make that happen for you. I got a great spot right on the river. It'd be beautiful. Please come to Seymour. Isn't Chiller the name of like one of those horror conventions you go to? Like yeah, Chiller Theater. Yeah, okay. That you, would be good too. Total non sequitur. But. You're a horror convention guy. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Monster Mania. Really? I got brochures right in the in the next uh, next room. If you're if you're, you're like interested. an onion, we just keep peeling back layers of you. Oh, you're not. I thought you were being sarcastic. I no, you didn't I really I, didn't know that. No, no, we're going to be sponsoring the. Uh, I just found out the Friday the Thirteenth double feature in Seymour at the Strand Theater, January Thirteenth. Wow. Malini.org. No, org. No, I'm definitely going. Will you say a few words? Get up on the mic. No, I don't. I'm not going to show up. Wow. All right, that's that. I got nothing else. What's yeah. your favorite horror movie? The Thing. Mm. John Carpenter's The Thing. Wow, there was no hesitation there. Mm. Yeah. It's What's your, yours? I, Willy Wonka. The original. <laughs> that was terrifying. None of, this, none of this Johnny Depp nonsense. You're classifying that as a horror movie. No, oh, what, no, what horror kind of, movie. What kind I thought of you meant just upbringing favorite upbringing movie. Did you have? <laughs> just, I don't do horror movies. They're scary. I don't like those. What about yours, Ethan? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd have to think about it. I, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Favorite movie of all time would, would be the Something L- French. Le Cercle Rouge. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> wow. Lame. Wow. Actually, and I'd recommend if you if anyone's listening still, <laughs> which they're not, uh, go to uh, filmstruck.com. That's a good, you could watch a lot of classic movies there. I've, I've recently gotten into that. So Once I'll share it, some more reviews. Can we have your username and password days. so we can not have to pay? Uh, no. No. Support. Support uh, them. All right, I'm Eugene Driscoll. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you, First Selectman Kurt Miller, for your time. Later.